Okay, so um, yeah, so my presentation will be slightly messy. I just finished it uh, on the airplane here. Uh, so it will be a bit of a surprise to myself as well. And um, the idea is really to, I'm not going to explain a kind of story of how we built a pavilion or a kind of you know, technical journey through the pavilion, but what I really want to do is give you a kind of larger framework to understand, uh, like in a way give you kind of tools to understand why this pavilion is there, or what, what we are trying to do with the pavilion. So it's going to be a kind of fly through through a list of topics ranging from nature to politics to uh, bio to technical aspects uh, and even uh, we'll even talk a bit about architecture as well. Um, so for those of you who haven't uh, been to the site yet, these are just some quick pictures still when we were removing the scaffolds um, two days ago. Um, and it is actually challenging, yeah. And uh, so the first thing, first of all, I, I would like to not call this a pavilion. So that, that, that's kind of the first statement that was also there in the beginning since the, um, since the competition, the idea that it's actually something uh, less innocent than a pavilion. It's not just a kind of a folly or a technical demonstration, but it actually wants to be a little bit more than that and has a kind of larger aspiration. So this is kind of a quick overview of uh, the topics I'm going to talk about. So I gave it like a little title. So we're going to talk a bit about nature, about the 1%, about shells, the discrete building blocks, and a few other topics. Um, so these are just some images of the competition. And uh, the competition de uh, de design proposal was all based on the idea of a building block and then a kind of possibility of, uh, to assemble and reassemble um, the project. I'll explain that in a bit more depth. So there is this kind of sequence, this possibility of taking everything apart, shipping it somewhere else in the world. But so uh, to start and in a way to connect also with uh, the team of BioTalin and with uh, Claudia's introduction. Um, actually, I'm supposed to like read this because I don't know it by heart. This will be difficult. Yeah, so the kind of first provocation that was in the, um, the competition entry was the idea of uh, a non-metaphorical uh, reference to nature. So I'm really kind of allergic to um, uh, the kind of tendency in architecture which tries to uh, engage with nature through metaphorically kind of copying it, through using natural algorithms and then kind of applying it to nature. So there were, there's some nice statements there. You can probably read them. I actually can't read them from here. Um, Anyway, and then uh, this connects ver very much also with uh, Claudia and uh, Marco's uh, practice, I think, that kind of a provoking image of Edward Bortinsky, which is really talking about the fact that today there is actually no more uh, dichotomy between uh, what is natural and what is, uh, what is human. There's a complete intersection, and I think if you talk about things like biotech, and, uh, but also things like biocapitalism, which someone like Philip Morel has extensively written about, like the... The, the timber industry, for example, has very little to do today with nature and with biology, but has much more to do with a kind of system of, lo of logistics and management, and in a way also of design of our natural environment. So we wanted to, to take this kind of provocative uh, vision, not a kind of celebration of nature in a kind of a German tradition of biomimicry and of kind of celebrating nature as this um, pristine and uh, moralistically pure world outside of uh, our own societies, outside of the city, but really understand that today there is no more uh, dichotomy between, um, in a way, between even like uh, uh, capitalism, biology, and nature. Um, so yeah, it's arguing here that the, uh, it tries to take a distance from that almost kind of 19th century romantic idea of nature. Um, and so it excuse any visual references uh, to uh, biological or natural, so it's, it's black, for example, it, 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 there's no green, there's no uh, kind of uh, cheap direct references to, to bio as in, as in something green. Uh, it's also quite toxic, actually, it's a tar, it's not a, it's not a very friendly material. Uh, and also visually, it's not organic, it's, everything is, uh, is made of, uh, of sharp edges. So that was kind of a first entry provocation to the competition. And then the second one was actually rejecting the idea that it's a pavilion, so it's an anti-pavilion. So in many ways, I want uh, to, kind of to kind of suggest that we have to understand this pavilion much more as uh, half a domino. So it's much more 
um, in a way, kind of abstract building system. It doesn't have a facade, it doesn't have a floor, but similar to the domino, it's kind of representing a core of an architectural model, and, it, and it's kind of uh, much less innocent than just a kind of um, obsession maybe with materiality or, or, or technical aspects. So it, it's kind of has a pretends to, it, it wants to aspire to this, kind of, uh, to this kind of model. So it's not a pavilion. And this is also a criticism in a way as a kind of younger generation of architects to um, what now is like broadly called to parametric. So it's kind of active um, rejection of uh, the kind of whole tradition of the parametric pavilion. We've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of pavilions being constructed in the last, over the last decade in multiple architecture schools and competitions. And in many ways, you can ask yourself the question, what, what have we actually reached by doing all these pavilions? Like, okay, we're showing we can bend some, uh, you know, some uh, panels in, in curved shape. I've done it myself, like some of the pavilions there are things that I did myself in another life. And in, in a way, like the kind of, um, it's almost like a kind of technical Mannerism. And if you look at the challenges um, that we're facing as a profession today and the kind of crisis that is um, globally facing the world, which is this uh, crisis around housing, around uh, the 1% versus the 99%, then you could actually make an argument that all these parametric pavilions cater for the 1%. So they are there to uh, build uh, complex roofs for expensive museums. They're there to decorate the lobbies of banks, uh, the expensive... Uh, maybe marketing, uh, like marketing systems for universities, etc. But then they're, they're not actually addressing a kind of uh, the kind of 99% of the building stock. And uh, also, if, if you kind of quickly observe this kind of experimentation with uh, the 1% of the building stock, you also see that they're all shells. And that's a very simple uh, reason. I, I, I believe, like the the shell is a very limited. We're in a shell right now. It's it's a program. It's it's a, it's a typology that works for certain kinds of spaces, public buildings, gas stations, sports halls, but it's not something that works for the core of architecture, which is, in a way, you could argue, housing. Um, so the provocation was really like, okay, let's reject that model and let's really look at, uh, for example, what is happening uh, with uh, CLT, which is something also Seaman Siller referred to as a kind of um, a building system that is really starting now to break through in terms of housing. And let's really look at this kind of models as a reference for the pavilion rather than just uh, creating another one of those funky shells. And this steps into kind of a larger discussion about what I call shells and dominoes. Next topic. And um, it's really kind of talking about this very strange moment in time. So if you look back to the, to the 60s and 70s, you see a lot of experimentation with timber on shells. So you have the famous grid shells by Fray Otto, and then you see a lot of experimentation on housing and concrete. So there is this kind of uh, clear uh, direction between materiality and in a way typology. And what we see today with, for example, the work of people like Philip Bloch at the ETH, is that concrete is really making a complete comeback in terms of shells, and timber is actually uh, entering the domain of housing. So you see a complete reversal in terms of materiality uh, with these two typologies. So in a way, now we're making timber dominoes and we're making concrete shells, which is a, a reversal of the model of the, of the 60s and 70s. Um, so in a way, this is kind of, it's an abstract image, but it's kind of, referring to that idea of a kind of a mega structure, a continuously expanding uh, timber-based building block, which can create high density, differentiated uh, spaces uh, to live in, which are accessible to a larger audience. So actually, when I started doing the competition, I didn't actually design the pavilion. I designed first a kind of building system and developed something that you can almost understand as a kind of a massive housing unit a uh, kind of large, vast uh, apartment block that kind of is built all of uh, the same building blocks um, and kind of make it accessible. And this taps into research that I do with my office and also with uh, studios at the Bartlett. And in a way, like these two images, that's just uh, from uh, something in Shanghai, but it refers in a way, if you look at the pavilion, try when you go there today, or maybe if you've seen it, try to imagine that it's actually in a way, a demonstration of this kind of building system for something that is much larger. And it's, um, next topic is uh, yeah, digital production. 
And so it, and that's in a way also the next provocation. So the, the other provocation is that architects have always looked at digital production from a very, very singular perspective. We've also, in the last like two decades with experimentation, we've always understood digital production as a mere affordance of uh, computer-controlled tools to create formal differentiation. And we've never understood digital production as something that has a, a, a political and a social impact. And if you look around you, if you think about the impact of automation today, of Uber, of the e-economy, you understand that actually digital production is not innocent. It's actually a political tool, it's a tool for social change, and it's also something, again, that we can design and author. And that underlies a lot of uh, research, both in uh, the Bartlett and in the office. And in many ways, the, the WikiHouse uh, project by Alistair Parvin is, is in, in many ways, a truly digital project, although it's not formally differentiated, but it's a project that can be manufactured anywhere in the world in a very quick time using only one machine. And that's really the kind of the core of the digital is cutting production chains short. And it has this kind of political agency that it enables people to um, bypass a large industrial framework and immediately get their hands on a simple machine and create their own living environments. Um, so this has been an agenda we've been working on in the, in the Bartlett. We've been uh, combining this with, uh, I won't spend too much time on this, with uh, theories about where automation is going, what the impact is of those tools. And um, also, one of my collaborators here, Ivo Tedbury, who's in the audience, for example, did a fantastic project in the Bartlett about uh, post-work housing where robots assemble kind of open source building blocks into a variety of, of uh, structures. And this, this is kind of just a series of provocations that in a way lead to something that uh, we call the discrete. And when I say we, it's not, it's a collective project, it's just, it's not actually my project. And I think it's important also to reference again to Claudia, who mentioned in, in the introduction the kind of dissolution of authorship, that it's not, it's not a Star Architects project, it's not a project of a singular individual. And again, it's also an invitation to look at the pavilion not as something that I just designed as a singular person. It's part of an ecosystem that has been growing between a generation of younger designers engaged in Innsbruck, in the Bartlett, at SciArc, at USC, which are all starting to re-question, in a way, the kind of paradigm of the last two decades and starting to uh, develop new computational uh, methods, new ideas about automation, all with this kind of uh, critical and also social political uh, implications. So we have people like Jose Sanchez, Daniel Köhler, Manuel Jimenez, Nathan Mellenbrink, and also the students we um, uh, kind of uh, teach, of course, in, in, in all the schools. And um, a kind of quick reference, a kind of quick introduction to understand that idea of, of what the discrete is about. So the discrete is just pointing out that if you talk about uh, the digital versus analog, that there must be an aspect of a kind of universal initial building block which acts a bit as a piece of data. So in a way, uh, an existing discrete system that is commercially available is Lego blocks. Lego blocks are a very good reference to understand the pavilion. But there's also a lot of work going on in MIT where people are looking at uh, kind of swarm-based, again, biological modes of assembly that are based on these universal building blocks. Um, and this is... Now it gets really boring, sorry for that. This then goes back to actually the fundamental criticism to the idea of continuity. And it equals basically discrete and digital versus analog and continuous. And in a way the kind of accusation is that the previous two decades of architectural experimentation that are based on continuity are fundamentally analog. So this is uh, Greg Lin's famous NURBS curve, which is um, ignoring the idea of the part and is in a way continuously and in an analog way interpolating between specific points. Um, and of course, if you then look at all these parametric pavilions that we have been seeing over the past two decades, you understand that they are a result of continuity. So as, essentially, when you create a continuous surface, it's a top-down process, and at some point, you will have to subdivide the surface into a series of uh, segments. So th this leads to almost a generation of people who have essentially sliced um, surfaces or forms into series of segments and made an argument that you can do it because we have robots or CNC machines which can cut out all these different elements, which is essentially a very top-down uh, process. Um, so the discrete kind of uh, su suggests a very different approach to this while maintaining that idea of, uh, of uh, differentiation. So this is a series of quick diagrams which are uh, breaking, to use Mario Carpo's words, breaking Greg Lin's curve into um, an assembly of uh, universal elements which are connecting and 
kind of computing uh, the same shape of the curve. And initially, the system is always three-dimensional as well, which is interesting. So it doesn't have this aspect of slicing embedded in it because it's essentially a process of, uh, of assembly. So that's kind of the, the, the provocation of the discrete to, in a way, also connect back to the anti-diagram, which is the diagram on top, the diagram of the modernist assembly, and put that now in a, in a model of digital assembly. And of course, there are, and that's another discussion, there are many references as well to the modernist project and the social implications that the modernist project had, which was fundamentally based on um, achieving mass housing for everyone rather than, um, in a way, uh, funky buildings, right? So there is also this kind of social connection. So this then goes to the idea of the building block. There are interesting references for the discrete. Uh, for example, Philip, uh, Philip Morel has created, uh, has created um, this kind of uh, universal building blocks. And in this case, also in the case of the pavilion, we're looking at building blocks that are never truly universal. So they are always exceeding, in a way, a boundary, which then becomes a kind of start uh, for um, negotiation and, in a way, also for, for composition. And uh, the building blocks that we used for uh, the project here in Tallinn are based on one sheet of uh, plywood. It's not a standard sheet, it's actually an off-standard sheet, which made it extra cheap. So we can fit one building block on one sheet. And uh, then there are a series of, uh, it's a set of parts, so it's not a universal element, but it's a set of parts uh, which can be created solely using one machine, the CNC machine. Structurally, it can be understood as uh, something that's called a box beam, one of the most stupid and primitive structural systems that exist, but really interesting because with flat materials you can achieve um, really large spans and it, it's a very cheap, uh, very cheap material. So this is in a way how it started uh, three weeks ago on site, uh, a bunch of off-standard uh, timber plates that arrived in um, the CNC factory, we started milling them out. And uh, structurally the idea is that we create these box beams and then uh, they're connected under tension. So we, we, we put a, a, a threaded rod through these box beams, which creates what my engineer, Manja van der Warp, who's also here in the audience, calls a staggered bolted beam, it's called. I don't know if it actually exists, but that's in the engineering report. This is called a staggered bolted beam. And uh, so by adding these elements together, you can create a kind of a continuous uh, beam that, that can reach uh, quite large cantilevers, as you will see in the pavilion. It's kind of hovering above the ground and reaching out to four meters uh, almost on all sides. Um, th these are some images of our uh, factory space, which we temporarily set up uh, here in Tallinn, in the, in the Lucky Building. So we're creating all these building blocks, these large Lego-like pieces. Some of them are coated in uh, tar to protect from the fantastic weather here in, uh, in the Baltics. Uh, then we ship them all to the site on a big truck. It arrived like this. Then there is this scary moment that you're on the site and there is uh, literally um, nothing. And um, this is just a slight side ex excursion because we have these kind of images of all these building blocks. And then the, these are just some references I actually always produce of my projects I do with the office, the kind of the set of parts. So this is a set of parts for a larger museum project I did in Korea. And then this is the kind of the assembly you get out, out, of the, out of the kit of parts. And so also, again, if you look at the pavilion, try to kind of, it's kind of an opportunity to try to connect this to maybe more domestic spaces or try to imagine this thing not just as a frame, but maybe as something that resonates with this kind of more domestic uh, environments. These are just some projects from the office which all make use of um, similar building blocks. Um, and then again, yeah, so the scary moment when you're on the site and there is this guy just kind of leveling out the foundations and there's nothing else. And then uh, with just uh, four people, we started uh, putting these blocks together. Uh, it has a four millimeter tolerance across the whole structure, so it's uh, extremely, you have to be extremely precise, but it also forces you to be precise because the elements almost like snap together and kind of, um, yeah, bring, bring, bring the structure together. These are Ivo and Oscar putting a few blocks together in uh, the columns. And then, of course, the most exciting uh, moment is then when you try to combine, when you're starting to work on height, and you try to combine uh, bridges together, because then you see how much your four millimeter tolerance is working out. So as you see here, there's quite a big gap between these two beams that have to meet. 
but then you know with a bit of uh, force you can uh, you can bring them back together. So this now will jump again in a slight uh, boring uh, site um, excursion. Uh, it's called We Have Never Been. So in a way, this is kind of giving a few more aesthetic or architectural tools to understand like where we see this in a kind of architectural history. Sorry for showing Colin Rowe in this event. But so it's quite interesting in terms of um, Colin Rowe basically made his accusation that modernism was never modern because the mode of composition is based on uh, uh, a kind of classical model. And then we know that Peter Eisenman uh, tried to make a kind of uh, truly modern architecture based, uh, based on that. And it's kind of this display on uh, Bruno Latour, we have never been modern and uh, being digital by Nicolas Negroponte. So there's a kind of statement behind the pavilion that if you look back at the two decades of digital research that actually we have never been digital. And then in a way, the kind of uh, unexpected uh, project of, of, of this pavilion is a moment where you could argue that it's uh, starting to be digital. Uh, Smooth again is another slight excursion for people who are interested in like architectural uh, theory and philosophy. So if you look back at uh, Gilles Deleuze and the way how the generation of the 90s looked, understood the smooth and the striated, so they basically always argued that um, uh, the continuous has a direct reference to the smooth, but actually if you look at the, the way how the continuous was materialized, which means it was always sliced, which is actually a striation, a top-down striation of a continuous surface. And then actually the smooth, if you really want to achieve a kind of delusion smooth, that refers like to, if you know this kind of things like the nomad army, swarms, etc., you actually have to look into a universal building block that has a mode of interaction between them to create a kind of top-down movement. So the pavilion, although it looks edgy, is actually smooth. So it's completely smooth and actually establishes a kind of, uh, ph phenomenologically speaking, a continuous structure. Um, yeah, and then just some like last thoughts to wrap it up, comparing the domino and um, the pavilion. So there, there's, of course, like a few crucial differences between these two. The domino was a model based on prefabrication as well. Uh, but every element has a specific performance within the structure. You have columns, you have slabs, you have stairs, and uh, they're kind of typologically defined, and in a way, as a mode of composition, indeed refer back to still to a kind of classical mode of composition. In this element, in this, um, in our kind of domino uh, for tap, in a way, uh, elements that are used as beams also are used as columns, so in a way, it's a very organic and continuous structure, Maybe not visually, but um, fundamentally it is a continuous and organic structure because the same building element reappears both as a column, as cantilever, as compression element, as tension element, as bridge. Um, and then just some last observations about uh, the slabby aspect of this thing. So it's also an invitation to look at this project and not look at it as slabs and columns because there are no slabs and columns, they are just building blocks. And they may they come together or they kind of emerge into a form of a slab or a building block. But technically speaking, there is no slab and there is no column. So that is not a column, right? These are five discrete pieces together. Yeah. So if uh, yeah, so if you point at it, just say like this five discrete pieces which act as a column or something, but they are not a column. Um, yeah, so this is just looking at uh, how the same element starts to form the column. Uh, I just said it started to form uh, this, this support structure. It completely hovers over the ground, which is kind of reference to, in a way, uh, I have a kind of Mies obsession, so it's kind of a, a reference to this, this kind of Miesian position to the ground. And the same also, the color black is also kind of a purely aesthetic uh, series of decisions. These are just some projects from my office which are articulating the kind of same aesthetic references that you will see in the pavilion. So it's the kind of, um, yeah, a, a kind of uh, moment where you have a building that is never truly finished. I call it in part whole. So it's whole, but it's only partially whole. It can kind of continuously um, keep extending. And there is this kind of yeah, slap-like articulation, kind of horizontality, and then a kind of contrast between outside and inside through a gradual um, difference in material. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it there. Very important before I close is uh, I'm gonna do a very big thank you tonight uh, for the opening of the pavilion. But I would like just to thank uh, the core team which um, helped realize this project. And again, also make a statement that 
<coughs> authorship today is distributed, and in many ways, these are really truly collaborators and all share authorship in the, in the creation of this project. Thanks so much.